Hey everybody, I am so glad to be back. We made it to season three and this is our season opener. Yay! So I have a lot of good interviews lined up with different band folks and I cannot wait to share them with you. But in the meantime, I also want to share some good news. On June the 29th, Another book is coming out about HBCU bands. Yay! So we're doing the second volume of the HBCU Experience HBCU Band Alumni Edition. Like I said, it'll be out on June 29th, and you can get it on Amazon.com, or you can get it on the HBCU Experience Movement website. The great thing about it is, is that we have 45 new authors alums from different HBCU bands and they all tell their stories and they're fabulous but I'm not going to belabor the point anymore let's get into our first interview I'm talking with Brian Simmons who is the director of bands the head director at Texas Southern University he's a southern alum he marched for the human jukebox and so we're going to hear all about his story and how he got to his head director position all right y'all I am very, very pleased to have on my show the director of Texas Southern University, Mr. Brian Simmons, who is a graduate of Southern University, March for the Human Jukebox. And this is our first conversation, I guess you could say. I mean, I of course, I, I know about you and we have plenty of mutual friends, but um, yeah, it's really nice to meet you, Brian. Same here. Same here, Christy. And thank you for having me on. Good. Good. Yes. I, I'm so glad to have you on. Um, all right. So really, I just want to get into, you know, your history and everything. And so we're going to start way back from the beginning. So what is your hometown? Um, I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, born and raised. I am a 2010 graduate of McDonald 35 Senior High School. Um, when I was in 35, I played in the band as well. Uh, I played baritone. I was section leader. I was a uh, bandsman of the year for two years. Um, I got a lot of uh, awards uh, through the school. It was a fun time. Um, I, I credit New Orleans and thank New Orleans for instilling, you know, such a good appreciation of music in me. And uh, it's led me to this point. All right. Yeah. So, you know, growing up in New Orleans, such a musical, musical town. When were you first exposed to like HBCU marching bands or maybe just the, the jukebox in general? Um, My dad, funny enough, he it, I, maybe it wasn't until I was maybe 10, 11 or 12 in that, that little age group to where it's, he told me, or oh, I found out that my dad actually marched in Southern Band. Really? Um, yeah, my dad is a, a, a championship football uh, basketball coach. He won a state championship with Carver High School in New Orleans and John Eric uh, in Marrero, Louisiana. And so, you know, my whole life, I'd always known him to be that. We never talked about anything else. And he would always go to, you know, a Southern game here or there. He wasn't that guy. He was just like, you know, I'm going to go see what's going on, just get out the house for a little minute. But he wasn't the shaker, uh, pom-pom with your cone and your chair and your blue and gold shirt. Wasn't that guy. You wouldn't even know he was there. But uh, I went to a few performances with him when I was younger. And to be honest, I was not moved. And what I mean by not moved, I just... You know, when you 9, 10, 11, you don't care about that. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad was like, look at the band. I'm like, I don't care. Like, I'm not worried about that. And then maybe when I was 12, um, I was at my grandmother's house and when, uh, she was watching me and my brothers. And I guess my brothers were being all ruly. And so she was like, sit down. Y'all sit down and watch the band. So she turned on TV and it's the blue and gold band vers versus the black and gold band. <laughs> and... I was just like, okay, this is interesting, I guess. All right, all right, I, I can dig it. So then once I got into, you know, middle school and things of that nature, I needed something to do after school. So I was like, you know what? I thought that band stuff was really good. Let me give it a try. So I, I think I probably picked up a horn in maybe about seventh grade, but I, I've seen Southern many times before that, but my mind wasn't just in tune to what was going on. But I really, um, maybe about 2006, 
2006 mm-hmm. is when I saw Southern live. Um, by that time, I've been playing in band about two years, but I had the whole those two years that I was learning how to play. I never saw Southern. So I never truly made the connection or got an appreciation for what was going on. But in 2006, I went to Bayou Classic. And so when I went to Bayou Classic and I sat in front of Southern, I was like, wow, like this is what this is. This is what it's supposed to sound like. So I would say 2006 was probably the first real time I felt and was able to witness and experience Southern University marching band. Wow. You know, I I always just consider you being a band head. I'm surprised you didn't really get like into bands until middle school. I'm a music. You know what's funny? I'm a I was always a music head. Mm-hmm. I was the guy in but from second grade all the way to present day, I'd be the guy walking around with my headphones in. I always was into music. I like the way it makes me feel. I like the different emotions. I, I, from a young age, I was able to, you know, break down song lyrics and then be able to like understand them against the harmony and chord structures of music. So I always had a weird understanding of it, even younger. And so marching band um, opened that up for me because it was some music was something that I liked and had a love and passion for, but being in a band I was actually able to participate create and make music so Mm -hmm. I was like yeah let me play my one little horn so I can be a part of this 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 grandiose thing so uh I think I was a music head all my life but I became a band head maybe around 2004 I was a band head and then when I saw Southern in 06 changed it all (laughs) wow (laughs) I'm just blown because you're saying like 2004 2006 oh man I did not realize there was an age such an age difference between us that is funny so you you play baritone and that that was the first instrument you played right first instrument I played was trombone but the band director used to always tell me my arms wasn't long enough <laughs> <laughs> because trombone it goes you know it's, it got the slide and it goes all the way down to like six and seven I couldn't mm-hmm. get there okay okay and what did your dad play Oh, my dad played, ironically, baritone after I was already playing baritone. I found like it was just it was a random conversation one day. He's like, yeah, I played a Southern band. I'm like, huh? What? He's mm-hmm. like, yeah, I played baritone. I'm like, that's what I play now. He's like, yeah, you know, it just happened like that. I'm like, this is crazy, dude. Mm-hmm. So your high school, you know, definitely does high step in. And I mean, was that the first? Did y'all perform at Mardi Gras and things like that? Oh, yeah. Um. Yeah, we, we performed at Mardi Gras. We, McDonald 35 is, you know, most people don't know, but in, in the city of New Orleans, you know, that is the oldest high school for Black children mm-hmm. in New Orleans. So it, it 35 has a, a historical standpoint on the city of New Orleans. So they've always had a band at Mardi Gras, always had a band in the football stand, always had um, an alumni feel. So I got a lot of that in high school, but Southern was just another level. It was a whole nother level. Wow. So, okay, now I'm putting two two and two together. So were you in high school when Katrina hit? Yeah, Katrina hit, I was in middle school, but I was still in band. Okay. So I was okay. eighth grade. All right. So what happened to your band? Um, everybody, everybody just um disbanded for the for the hurricane. And then after um the hurricane, maybe in about spring 06, 35 was the first school that was open back up. For, for students so Katrina hit August 29th 2005 McDonald 35 was performing in Mardi Gras in spring 06 mm-hmm. but you know the thing about it is it, it was a trying time because you know I was I was really getting good at what I was doing and that hurricane just messed it up so it kind of stunted my growth a little bit and and not too much because I was always a guy who liked to practice I used to like to go home you know, when I first started playing my instrument, I remember the first couple of months and weeks and days and stuff, I was just trash. And <laughs> the older guys would be like, man, like you need to do this, you need to do that. But what they didn't know was, I would go home and practice every day. And then my dad, um, I, I was staying with him. And so he would make me practice. Weird enough, like he didn't even, he would, he up in here worried about his basketball team. He just busted in a deep practice. I'm like, no start practicing. So I'm practicing and stuff. I'm like, this man not even listening to me. He's not hearing me. But I will come back every day better than the day before. And those guys start to see that in the band. And so when Katrina hit, it just kind of messed all of that up. 
because I couldn't practice and do the things that I wanted to do. But when I was able to get my hands back on the horn, it was over since that to that since that point. Okay, so I'm thinking like the 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 gap in you know you said it stunted your growth like your, your growth because of the hurricane and things. That's reminding me of COVID. Like I, mm. I see some similarities with with COVID. And yeah. Have you noticed that? Like, do you um, know? yeah, it, it's it's the same, but it's different. I'm gonna tell you why. Like this generation of students now, they are very intelligent, highly intelligent. Um, you know, a lot of knowledge we had to go beat down the library and go in a book to find, or, you know, we'd have to get our library cards and take our little internet time to learn. These kids, they learn stuff like that, whether it's on the TV, whether it's a song lyric, whether it's on social media. So they are very smart. But the thing about it is that that practice part of them is still a little bit gone. They don't, they don't drive like we used to because they're a little smarter than we were mm-hmm. if that makes sense so yes during covid i've seen that uh with our students you know they'll they'll come back and they'll they were a little fuzzy on the instruments and stuff like that but ultimately it's because they wanted a break but um as for me covid was probably the best couple of months of my life ever <laughs> really in yes. what way um i'm a workaholic um when see a whole nother side of this is well before i came to southern university um i was a founding member of the new orleans all-star band like Mm -hmm. i was in high school doing that so i was running a band writing arrangements teaching going to battle bands like people saw me they saw band clips and everything like that the semester before i even crabbed at southern university so i came into southern university a lot of the people like you're the guy from the band clip you this guy they knew who i was So from that point on, from summer 2010, all the way till COVID, I never stopped doing band. I never stopped working. Mm -hmm. I went to Southern University. I graduated in four years. Uh, The semester after I graduated, well, not even the semester after I graduated. I graduated May 14th, June 23rd. I was promoted to assistant director of bands at Southern. See, that, that is, that's insane. That is like a meteoric rise. I've never... I've never heard of anybody go that fast. Goodness. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why, but and that was the that was the gift and the curse. Um, because I I, I believe in that. Like um, one of my favorite comedians, Ali Sadiq, say, you know, you don't hope, you hustle. Mm-hmm. That's how you get stuff done. So from spring, like I said, summer 2010 till May 2014, I was at Southern doing. Uh, my all-star band stuff in the summer and in the winters. And then in summer 2014, I started at Southern and I worked. I never stopped working till COVID. That is, that is crazy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, no wonder you are like where you are. That, yeah. That's insane. <laughs> and I love, and, I, and, and the crazy thing about it, and, and I'm glad that that part of the conversation came up because I think that it's important for people to know, you know, sometimes we get so caught up on the, on the hamster wheel that we lose ourselves. And during COVID, I just, it's so crazy. I felt after maybe a week or two, I felt 16 again. Mm. I felt like that. I felt like the kid or the the young man that I left in New Orleans when I went to Baton Rouge, I found him. I found all of my old interests. I found things that made me tick. I found out that there's a bigger world out here than, you know, recruiting kids, getting the band ready, getting all this other stuff. It made me appreciate music on a whole nother level because I got, I took time to think about, you know, the things that I actually like. Mm-hmm. So I found myself during COVID. COVID don't get, it don't get any complaints from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's funny you say that because like I was talking to a coworker about how much work I got done at home during the lockdown because we didn't have any um I didn't I wasn't getting calls it wasn't people walking to my office every five minutes and like even just some of the best performance reviews that I've gotten in my career were the years that I was working at home <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah it, it, and, and COVID you know we as people we go through this thing especially like after college and even maybe through high school we get 
accustomed to being around people and things so much that it drains you. You mm-hmm. almost, you know, I didn't realize that even from 2014 to 2020, I was just doing and I was very successful, but I wasn't even working at 100%. Mm-hmm. I wasn't working at 100%. And then COVID, I found at 100%. Like my last semester at Southern, I can hands down say it's some of the best work of my career, if not the best. Wow. That, mm-hmm. that, that's great. Well, let's let's go back a little bit because I want to hear about your experience as being a student at, at Southern. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your first um your first camp. Um being a student at Southern. Jen generally started at band camp because the day I came, the first day I came, I came from New Orleans. Uh, the band culture is very different um, in New Orleans. And when I got to Southern, you know, I tell students all the time, I used to, uh, especially when I was recruiting, I tell a student like Southern University is different. It's unlike anything you ever experienced. They, they used to always ask me, how do I get ready? How do I practice? How do I prepare? I said, just keep doing what you're doing, but understand that It'll never be enough. You know, mm-hmm. at Southern, uh, during my freshman camp, I can probably honestly say I played more in two weeks than I played ever before then. Right, right. <laughs> it was nonstop over and over and over and over. And so that is crazy to say, but I didn't even think about it until today. But I don't think up until that point I had been challenged that much in my life. Mm. And for the first time in my life, I really felt like musically I was learning. I felt like I was being taught. See, I used to say when I, when I was in high school, middle school, I would always go home, listen to music, study, do my research, and then come to school, and I wouldn't really learn anything. You know, I would practice on my own and be better than other people. But Southern made it to whereas I came in there prepared and ready to learn every day because every day was something new, and it was something that I didn't know to a level that I had never experienced. So... Uh, it woke me up real quick. It let me know that, hey, you know, even though you didn't, was this guy in your band, even though you ran a band, when you come here, you are a student, you're going to learn from the best. Mm-hmm. So um, I was just humbled just from the beginning, day one. Um, Southern made me a little more social, too, um, when I got there. When I got there, I wasn't, I, I'm a introverted people person, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Like, I can have a conversation with the best of of people with the worst of people and it can be genuine everything and it could be a hundred percent real but at the same period of time like you really got none of me out of it <laughs> if that if that makes sense right. and so i and then i never felt the need to really be around anybody like just because you fit in don't mean you don't don't mean you belong that's that's the just the model i always had but being that southern you come in there with a hundred kids you got crab brothers and sisters now. You know what I'm saying? I have three brothers. I never had no sisters. So I learned a lot, you know, through that experience. But um, my student days was filled with just learning and grinding. I learned from the best people that I could at that time. When my band director was Lawrence Jackson, Mr. Hamer, all of them. They taught me daily. They saw that, okay, this kid got a gift and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna help him hone in on that. We're going to help him harness that. And I was just grateful for it. Okay. Yeah, this is this is good stuff here. So what made you want to be a music major? Because, I mean, you came in like, well, I mean, you know, you started in, in middle school and mm-hmm. you were like, I guess I'll do this band thing. And then now, you know, you have a whole degree in it. So, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> my answer, every time people, I had to have this conversation maybe four or five times a year because I have to tell it to a student because when I came to Southern I majored in music because that's all I knew I was good at mm-hmm. you know what's crazy is um every day of my life now is a is a blessing in, in my eyes because coming into college I couldn't see myself past 20 couldn't see myself past 21 I didn't I had no view of what my future was and what it would be so I like you know what I'm gonna try this music thing I should be successful. I'm apparently people tell me I'm good at it. Let's just see how it goes. So they would always ask me when I was in class, um, oh, you're gonna be a band director, you're gonna be a good band director. I'm like, I ain't gonna be no band director. And it was like, why not? That's what you do, you're good at it. I'm like, I don't know. I just wasn't passionate. I, I I was passionate about teaching, I was passionate about music, I was passionate about band directing and all this stuff, but when I looked at it, I didn't see a check. 
I didn't see a career. I was just like, that's just something I was good at. I wanted to be, you know what I was wanted to do? What I what I would what I was gonna do? I was gonna be a mortician. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, and then I had it was for the stupidest reason. I was like, hey, people die every day and they get paid. So that's what I thought. <laughs> well, you know, that that's smart. And then like I know people that have you know they do the assessments and they say um you should be a a, a funeral director because you some people are good at like calming people when they're under stress or when they're upset. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think it's maybe, maybe some of those skills transfer over, you know? Oh yeah. And, and, and it was once I made, once I got into my major and I started doing all of the stuff about it and I tell young college students all the time, being whatever your declared major is, it's a marriage. And they're like, huh, what do you mean? I said, it's a marriage. I said, you going into this thing, you're dedicating yourself to this thing based on the idea of, oh, I think I can do this. I think it's make, it looks good from the outside. Now, once you locked in, you're going to be learning a whole bunch of stuff that you didn't know. You're going to be going, that thing going to bring you through the ringer. But if that's something that you love and that's something that you dedicated yourself to and you want to see it through the end, you got to stick with it. You know, right. the manager, kids, te- they, they treat, and I keep saying kids, students, students treat college and being and majors like that's their boyfriend or their girlfriend, <laughs> you know, oh, we mm-hmm. broke up. What? What? <laughs> you said you wanted to be a doctor. Is it over that quick? <laughs> right. Right. OK, well, let's let's talk about some of these these robberies. You know, I've, I've had folks from Southern on my podcast before and they you know what? I'm going to let you answer this and then I'm going to figure out if you're going to say the same thing as they did. So mm-hmm. I want to talk about some of your noted um, rivalries when you were marching. Um, or, or it could be like memorable games or things like that. Okay, I can give you that. Um, rivalries are, are kind of stamped. Um, they, 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 they survive through time. They just survive through change. No matter who the coach, no matter who the band director, no matter who the president like they stand no matter if the band is big the band is small grambling mm-hmm. that's something that is a rivalry that it don't matter what it is it don't matter if the world fame is 200 plus 150 them and the human jukebox gonna see each other every year on that thursday um i mean on that that uh friday after thanksgiving for that battle of the bands and that game on that saturday um jackson state university okay. um jackson state university is a different kind of intensity it's almost like a battle of the juggernauts a little bit yeah you know grambling is a battle for the for the for the about for the boot for the bayou it's some it's just some louisiana stuff that everybody not going you ain't gonna get it Mm -hmm. but jackson state university is the was always the fight for who's number one the boom that's, box <laughs> yeah that's what it was always the fight for who's number one now we had little small little things here or there southern and fam you always had like a little you know, competitive competition between the two. So when I was in the band, I was lucky enough to where we didn't see FAMU all the time. So I was lucky enough to see them one year in 2011. That was really good. Um, okay. Southern and TSU, Texas Southern, it's just always been like a, just a fist fight. Mm-hmm. It wasn't even, per- it was never personal. It was just like, we're going to fight because, um, but the ocean, I remember when I was in the band, one thing Texas Southern had, that, that, that little band they used to have, Oh, they was going to crank on you. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, they was, was going to crank on you. Absolutely. So, mm-hmm. so every time every time we saw them, you know, it was it was time to really let them hang. Um, hmm. Everybody else was, was pe- in passing. Well, you know what's interesting is that um, I've interviewed some Southern folk on here, and they say, <laughs> well, our only rival is ourselves. Our only rival is ourselves. Of, yeah, you know, that is true. That, that, that is true. But I mean, I, as, as for the human jukebox, the only rival is itself. But mm-hmm. for Southern University, then I wouldn't necessarily say that's true. Like the human jukebox, we are, we always say our only rivalry is ourselves. Our only competition is ourselves because we mm-hmm. always want to be better than the previous band. We always want to be better than the previous performance. That is what we gauge by. We don't look at what Jackson State is doing and say, okay, we need to do this. You don't look at what Grambling is doing or, or what Alabama State is doing and say, we need to do this. We look at what Southern has done previously and we ask, oh, how are we going to top that? So 
most definitely like the human jukebox every time we used to march into the stadium we really wasn't worried about what nobody else was doing you know the right. name of the game is good offense if you got good offense defense don't matter mm, so okay yeah so but for the university itself Oh yeah, Jackson State, uh, Grambling, all of that. Though that is real. I I can't deny that. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember going to a boombox and sitting in the horseshoe at Jackson. I have not gone to a boombox where it's been at Southern at Mumford yet, but I, yeah, <laughs> that was an experience. <laughs> so, how was it after you graduated and you immediately were on staff at Southern? What was that like? I can give you a. A uh, happy podcast answer, or I can give you the truth. I want the real. Okay. Um, the real was I didn't really get a chance to sit in that or enjoy that because um it was at a pivotal time. I, my band director, Lawrence Jackson, he had just retired um the same in maybe June or late May. So I graduated May 14th. Um, uh, Mr. J was gone the end of May. Mr. Hamer was um, interim the end of May through June. And um, I always knew, I'm not going to say always, but maybe since I was maybe a sophomore or junior, I knew that that's what I was going to do because they trained me to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know when that time was going to come. But it came, I got the phone call. Mr. Hamer called me and said, you know, I need you to come up here and uh, do your paperwork, all that stuff like that. I left my job at Papa John's. <laughs> and, oh my goodness so you weren't even like a, you weren't even like a high school director or anything. no Just, no okay. I was slanging, I was I was I was slanging uh pizza oh, wow. what I, was doing. I did that for two years um and in two years like of course while I was in the band but once I graduated I went back to slaying my pizzas I, I left my graduation after I left it I took the the cap and gown off and I went go deliver pizza that night so, Wait a second! You didn't yeah. have like celebration with your family, or oh no, none of that. I told you, we don't we don't hope we hustle, you know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I got went and did all everything that I needed to do. The funniest part of that is uh, the night I graduated, I come in for my shift. It's like six thirty, and some of the some of the girls I was working with, they're like, "Congratulations, that big all this other stuff." The manager called me in his office and he says, um, "I heard you graduated." Congratulations. I'm like, thank you, man. Just want to let you know. You ain't getting no raise around here. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I left because it's like, brother, you must not know me. Like, this mm -hmm. is transitionary. Like, I would never, I don't, I'm not looking down on this job. I'm not looking down on the people who work it. I'm not looking down on the, the impact and service that it does to the community. But I'm destined for better and greater. So you can keep that little dollar twenty-five you thought I was gonna ask you for. I'm going to deliver this pizza until my until my time is is up. And so I worked that job maybe a couple, maybe three, four weeks more. And so Mr. Hamer gave me that call. He got he called me after I had finished the first delivery of the morning. So the restaurant opened. <laughs> the restaurant opened at 10. I, at that time, I was like the only driver there. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah. So I delivered like four pizzas during the order. And so I cut, I came back. That morning, hey, Mr. Hamer called me. I said, look, I'm about to deliver this last little pizza. Then I'm on my way. I come back to the store. The manager, okay, I've got all these pizzas for you. And you got to say, hold on, brother. <laughs> we got to talk. He's like, what? I said, we got to talk. I said, man, I just got a call for a job, and I'm out of here. He's like, what you mean you out of here? You don't have a job I got? I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, Dad, I told you. Keep it. If, I hope you saved that $1.25. You said you weren't going to give me because you need to hire somebody right now. Wow. So, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, peace, y'all. It's been good. And the, and the lady uh, who was working the register, uh, she said, bye, Brian. You're going to be good now. You're going to be good now. We're going to be waiting for you to come back now. I said, I ain't going to be back. She said, oh, they all say that. I said, I ain't them all. I'm somebody else. I know that's <laughs> and I, right. And I walked up out of there. So um, that's how that was the whole process of me getting the call. But I got hired on a Thursday. I did my first audition on a Friday morning. When I woke up Friday for my first day at work, my call got told. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So I had to call Mr. Hamer and tell him, look, bro, look, I know I'm starting off. It's my first day at work. Forgive me. But my call got told in Denham Springs. I had to go get the car. Came back, did my first audition. Uh, I'm not even going to tell you who the student was. He was horrible. <laughs> okay. Good kid, though. Good kid, though. My, he my boy now. We good now. But 
The next week was high school band camp. And so we had 500 kids on my second day of work. Um, so I had to spend the weekend writing some music for the camp and just getting ready and planning. And the only, at that time, we had 500 students. But we all had three band staff members. It was Mr. Hamer. It was myself and Mr. Hart. So we all had to come up and find a way to, you know, uh, work with the kids so that, you know, we wouldn't spread too thin. But um, it was weird the first two months because, you know, people, people hated on me so bad. And they even know me. They hated on me so bad. They, and uh, it was different. How did the but, students take to you since you were so young? So, like, you know, I remember I actually got a job teaching when I on a at a college at Norfolk State. I used to work at Norfolk State. Um, I was 24, 25. And, you know, it just had its own challenges and, and things like that. So I guess my question was, you had just been marching in the ranks. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> were students like, you know. You know what's crazy is um, I, I've always been respected when I was in the band. Mm -hmm. And when I was in a band, I was a student arranger, student conductor, band captain, all of those things. And one thing, when we got in Isaac Gregg's band hall, I did not play about anything. Mm -hmm. And outside those glass doors, I was a fool. But when we got in there, I didn't play. And I built up a level of trust with them to where they already knew it was coming, to be honest. And so when it happened, it was just like, OK, all right. I think I probably had. Um, with the students, I had a smooth transition. I had a smooth okay. transition because I knew everybody. Um, I knew the type of foolishness they'll be on. You know, I, I never really tried to throw nobody under the bus too much. I always tried to handle things in, in the right and decent order, but I, I, would, I would always try to save them as much as I could. Um, I knew the plight and the things that they were going through at that time. I'd be talking to, talking to them about real life issues and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> Right. It was, they were they were amazing. The students were amazing. It's the adults that was on some foolishness. But you already yeah, now, know. Now that I believe. Mm -hmm. It was the adults that was on some foolishness. How he get this job? My crab brother been mm -hmm. teaching since 1980. What? Mm -hmm. Like, and at the end of the day, uh, Nathan Hamer gave me some good advice um, because I didn't talk to him about it. Like when I was going through, he, he knew what was up. He knew everybody was hating, but he said, man, just let your work do the talking. Mm -hmm. I said. I feel, like, I, I feel like I could hear him say that. I, I could mm -hmm. I could hear him say that. He said everybody. He said people call him crazy. He was like, man, everybody think I'm crazy for what I'm doing. But he said, I just I don't think that. I think that this is the right thing to do. And I wasn't sure that that was the right thing to do, but I knew I was going to prove him right. Right. Okay. Okay. So what was what was next after that? Like how, how long were you at um well the assistant at Southern? Like what was okay. what was next? Okay. Um well I was the assistant director at Southern University from June 2014 to June 2021. So um in between that time, I worked on staff with Louisiana Leadership, uh marching band. Uh I soon became director of the Louisiana Leadership Marching Band. Um, I ran the, the summer program for three years. I, I think my highlights of, of that um, endeavor was having the band perform for the inauguration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. And we were the only, we were the only like K through 12 little program that was on, that was featured. So we were featured with Southern University, Jackson State University, Grambling, Florida a and and you had old Louisiana Leadership. And we opened up the show and it was amazing. So I had some 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 little small ventures in there. Um, I started another all star band in Baton Rouge um, that's still performing to this day. Um, I would go back to New Orleans every now and then when I could to mm -hmm. be able to help them build and do some little different things with their band. So throughout that time, I, I, would, I, I did a lot of leg work. OK. Spreading the message of Southern University. That's what that was. That was my job. OK. Wow. And then after that, you that's when you you arrived at Texas Southern. Yeah. OK, so let's talk about that, man. You know, new director. We're in the middle of COVID. Right. Because this is what 20, last year. Right. Yeah. So we were so we were in the middle of it, but we was at the point to where they was like, all right, y'all can go outside now. 
<laughs> but you know, the map was still red. That's where we were. Wow, wow. So what what are some of the well, if you can share, what what are some of the the goals that you have um, uh, for the program? Well, with the band, mm-hmm. I think my biggest goal has been rebranding, and you know, I want something. I'm trying to create something that's definitive of the university. Um, you know, just like all programs, Texas Southern had, you know, they had their own controversies and things that they went through. And I made it my goal to when maybe within the next four years, I want people to not even remember none of that. None of that. I just want people to know all of the good. Um, I want to get the band more partnerships and sponsorships. And, you know, you in the city of Houston, Texas, you know, this is the about to be the, the uh third largest city in America. They're about to take over Chicago pretty soon. Oh, really? Yeah. So with that being said, you know, there's so many uh, opportunities and resources out here. So I wanted to be able to take that name, uh, Texas Southern University Marching Band, Ocean of Soul. I want to be able to brand it so that we can go out here and, and pull in different resources uh, and partnerships, not only for the brand of the band, but for the students. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just I just felt like we could be servicing them so much more. So Overall, I want to make the Ocean of Soul a household name, you know, and I've given myself some some small goals mm-hmm. um, and, and, and over time periods. You know, I got a four year goal, got two year goal. I, I had I reached my one year goal. So right now, you know, the one year goal was to be able to teach this band my expectation, because okay. a lot of times we come into a situation and we want people to move how we move. But you never taught them to move how you move and think how you think and do what you do. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure you've seen uh, a lot of people who get on the job and fail because they ain't pay attention to orientation. Right. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So luck, lucky for them, you know, this year I gave them a whole year of orientation. Okay. So you're yeah. just trying to establish that culture, like build that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you know, we always had a, a we always use the a, a two statements and slogans are, if you will, um, cliches, if you if you will, at Southern University. But the funniest thing was they were never used in order or in succession. But I've been using it in succession now. And the first thing was Rome wasn't built in a day. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's just basically I mean be patient. You know, the 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 greatest city uh, to modern America. You know what I'm saying? There's so many things that came out of philosophers, scientists, all this other stuff. It was not built in one day. The architectures and structures that you see in that place that are so divine and pristine and people still can't imitate. It wasn't built in a day. But the other part of that, that slogan is Rome was also defeated from within. Mm. Meaning that strong structure that you saw, the outside couldn't puncture it. It was the people on the inside. So I'm letting my band know, hey, be patient. This thing is going to be everything we want it to be. This thing will be historic. But also remember that the strongest historical thing was divided from within. So we all have to be together. We all have to have a shared vision of where we're going to do this thing. Right. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm just curious, what lessons that you've learned from Marching in the Human Jukebox what, what lessons do you bring to you on your job now as director of the Ocean of Soul? Um, be at the right place at the right time with the right equipment, ready to concentrate. You know what? That's a that's a Dr. Greg's quote, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that, I knew I knew it. <laughs> yeah, that one, that one for sure. Um, because it's it's everything. It's professionalism. It's 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 being attentive, it's being a student. It works everywhere. I make sure I, all my, my students know that. Um, that one, um, but also this is a this is another Isaac Graves cliche. Of course, he probably didn't make it up, but who knows where he got it from? But he would always say, you know, you stick your finger in a bucket of water and take it out, and ask me, did you leave a dent? And what that means is, you know, you think you that important? <laughs> you think you made you make that much of a difference? But uh, nah, not really. You know, you you are that 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 finger. And when you take it out, nothing changed, nothing moved. I let my students know that all the time because a lot of times people get big headed. Mm-hmm. They think that this thing can't, this thing can't move without me. Oh mm-hmm. please, tell me if you le- uh, left that dent. 
Right, right. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, let's get into this book. <laughs> so um, you are one of, one of the authors of mm-hmm. the um, HBCU experience, HBCU band alumni edition, mm-hmm. second edition. And I'm so glad that you could be a part of it. But just let me give my, my plug to Dr. Ashley Little, who is the visionary author of the series. And um, by the time this airs, I think you'll be able, you know, the the trailer for it will be out. But anyway, um, you'll be able to get it on Amazon.com and you'll also be able to get it on the HBCU Experience Movement website. And so if you could give me a little description without without spoiling it, but could you give a little teaser about the chapter that you wrote? I'm going to tell you this. The, the teaser of my chapter was pretty much the, not only just what I was telling you about um, me starting and having to deal with so much hate and animosity and, 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 and less, that's less of the word I want to use. I want to, want obstacles okay. of starting that job, you know, um, I, I talked a little bit about that, but also I went more in detail about my first day uh at southern i went more into detail about my first day um of band camp and not and not the part where we were actually playing and and working out and marching it was the day before which was the parent meeting and you know you had to move in on campus and i talked about my first real true interaction with mr j as my band director okay Uh, and you're going to get to see the culture shock for me okay Uh, all I'm, all I'm, all I'm gonna say is, and and very shortly, he let me know where I was real quick. Well, you know, it's it's funny that you describe it as culture shock because, you know, I would think that a city like New Orleans, where you grew up, it's so entrenched in band culture. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, it's different when I guess it's different when you get to college. It's it's, it's definitely not and the it, same thing. But the culture shock was, um, it was less musically. But it was more of the discipline that it requires to be in a college band. Mm -hmm. You know, high school is very flexible. You know, you you, sometimes, you know, teachers chilling, kids unruly, all sorts of stuff like that. And sometimes roles can be fuzzy, foggy. You get those lines, those barriers get crossed. You know, you have your band director. What's up, bro? That's how you speak to him. What up, man? Go, Go get your horn. That type of thing. And so mm-hmm. coming into Southern, it wasn't none of that. It was like, you you mind, you do what you're supposed to do. Yes, sir. No, sir. If I ask you something, you keep your eye on the prize and you do your job. Like, it's none of that other. So it was a level of discipline and structure that I had never experienced in my life. But I learned it really quickly. Before I picked up a horn there, I learned, I learned who, where I was, who I was there with, and what was expected of me. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I just have one final thing just to wrap this up. Is there anything that you feel is on your heart that you want to share? Because I really enjoyed our conversation and I've learned, I've learned a lot actually. So is there anything that you want to get across or anything that's on your heart right now? Um, I guess with the, you know, the topic at hand, you know, the thing I would always get people to understand is, you know, Southern made me, but Texas Southern pays me now. That's the difference. Mm-hmm. And so with that being said, you know, I don't speak about Southern as much as I, as I should or can because, you know, the, the conflict of interest there sometimes. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But without a shadow of a doubt, I love that place more than anybody can ever understand mm-hmm. because it made me a man. That's it made me a man like it, it forced me to grow up. It taught me so many hard life lessons being in that band and being on that job, being a student at, at that university. Southern was the first place to, to honestly teach me what black love really was. Mm. You know, I, I, I grew up around black people and black teachers, and black families and all this stuff my whole life. But I'd never seen it to that degree. I've never seen so many black strangers who don't know each other, but would do anything for each other just because you wear blue and gold. Mm-hmm. I don't even know your name. Here you go. <laughs> you know? And so I would want to get that across to people that, um, and in Texas Southern, I, I, I 
I don't I don't lie to my students. I don't lie to anybody. And they'd be like, you love TSU? No, nah, not yet. To love something, it's a it's a it's a up and down. It's a it's a it's a seesaw. Mm-hmm. You know, you do if 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 there's always good days, you don't love it. You in strong right. like of it. You got to be tested. And so this place is testing me every day, it's making me better. And um I have a strong appreciation for the university. Um, and I I do love the band because it's my child. Right. You know, I'm, it, right. It's, 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 it's my child, but um, Southern University will always be in my heart. And any way that I can support it, I definitely will. Right. I, mean, I, I completely understand that. It has been awesome talking with you. I'm so glad we got to do this. Me too. Me too. You have listened to the HBCU Band Experience with Christy Walker. Interviews and editing conducted by yours truly, Dr. Christy Walker. The music is District 4 by Kevin McLeod. And you can find this podcast on hbcubandexperience.podbean.com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Take care.